So I've talked about before how crisis demands change and change demands decision and decision has to have options or you can't decide. And in order to have options, you have to come into an awareness of more. Um, if you've already ran out of the options here, because nothing works here in this level, then you have to become aware of more. You can't be stuck in like, I keep running the same options. And for some reason, they just don't work. We have to come up into like, I am now aware there's a different way we could do this. I am now aware that I have options of things. We already talked about a few weeks back about how many times we believe we're right-handed. So because we believe that, we can only brush our teeth with our right hand. We can only write with our right hand. But the truth of the matter is we can go both. We just settled that we're only going to do one. We're going to take our predominant one, and that's going to be it. And we'll actually even throw off our body's balance and everything by favoring one side of the body. So, so when you take a look at that, it's like, hmm, our limits can, can throw off balance. Our limited thinking can do that. And so we have to have an awareness to come up and say, I'm aware of more options. And so sometimes you've hit a wall, you've tried all the options, and it's just like hope will leave you at that point because you don't have a joyful, confident expectation of something good because you're not aware of anything else but this. And you ran that scenario 150 times or sometimes more, right? And because it didn't make a way out, then it's like, you know, we're in trouble, it's over, things like that will start coming up in the mind, and uh, our confession will change to the impossible, it's too hard, too much, too little, too late, right? I'll never, I can't, it always. And they're, they're pretty big statements, like always, really literally means always, right? Or every single time. It's like literally every single time we get extreme because we're at the end of our hope. And all we need is an awakening to an awareness. Yeah. So when the spirit of God comes on us, he's literally pouring out his spirit to cause an awakening. Like you wake up to that. There is more. Oh my goodness. There's more. He has more. He's going to make a way where there seems to be no way. He's Jehovah Jireh. He supplies all my needs according to his riches and glory. There is more. And when that awareness comes, you can't just know that digitally. You have to be in spirit to know that. Like he moves on you. He comes upon you to have that. And suddenly you're aware that there's more, but what? You take that time with him and he'll begin to make you aware of more options. Creative ideas will come out of you. They'll come out of you. Now the victim prays the prayer that only looks for the answer to come out of all of you. Because I'm the victim here. You actually need to serve me. The world needs to serve me. It needs to come and have the answer. And so when I pray, I'm expecting God to change all of this so that I feel better. All of this so that I can change. All of this so then suddenly, see, these are the creative ideas that are supposed to heal me. That's a childlike way of thinking. That's arrested in development. That's a victim. He created you in his image. Amen. You're a creator too. Amen. That's what it means to be in his image. It means like kind. Yeah. You are like kind to God. Well, then we have to find out how is God? What is his character? How does he operate? What is his gifting? What, how does he do that? And if I'm like him, look out. I need to be able to tap into how he built this physical body and how my spirit can flow through it like he does right? And so the physical can also block us from the spiritual. It can, it can get in the way. It's like a barrier of, of uh, just knowing the spirit realm, because the spirit realm is right here, right now. Heaven is right here, right now. It's right here. Kingdom of God is right here, right now. That's why he said, repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. You know, he didn't say 15 miles away. He said, at hand, right here. And so how do we get into that kingdom is, is through repentance. We get new information, regret the old way, we make a change, we turn around and we go, I want that kingdom. And that's the sphere of his rule. The word kingdom means the sphere of his rule, his domain, how he does things. And so now we're going to cross over into that. You have to be aware that that even is before you can do that, right? And, and that's, that's what's sad for the lost in the sense, um, because if they're not aware of the heavenlies, then they're limited to what's right here. And there ain't much right here. I mean, it's pretty lame. 
because sin has taken out a lot of things. And, um, and so what we'll do is we'll take these small things and make them into big things and think we really got something going on. When the heavenlies would blow your mind. Yeah. And actually, it's right here. We talk about eternal life like it starts when we get over there. It starts when you receive Christ. You're in eternity either way. You just haven't departed to hell yet or departed to heaven. You're an eternal being created in the image of God. You're in eternity right now. But we use phrases that make it seem like there's a pause and then we got to wait to get over there before stuff starts happening. Now when we get to heaven, when we all see Jesus... You know, that's when everything's going to change. Well, if it's true, it's going to change. But he said to pray, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come on earth, in this earthen vessel, on this earthly planet, as it already is in heaven. So what's the point of praying if it's not going to manifest here? I mean, that's kind of a lame prayer. You're just like, yeah, send it, send it, but don't really. You know, it, I mean, it's, it's got to manifest here. His ideas manifest here. His imagery through uh, getting that over to you so you can see what he sees. Suddenly you have the image and you get to call that forth here on the earth. That's who we are. Religion kind of keeps us in this like, you know, big God. and We're just kind of walking around just like lost little sheep. We don't know. And he has mercy in our just stupidity. And I mean, we've really been reduced down to almost like we don't look like his family. We are family, Amen. sons and daughters right. to the living God who's all creative. And he creates a way where there seems to be no way. So we, we've talked about crisis demands change, change demands decision. Decision has to have options and you better be aware. And, um, and so sometimes awareness is talking to a person who's already been made aware, right? That's where we're supposed to be teachable. I always tell people, run with the big dog. Somebody who's gone some, somewhere that you haven't gone and has something that you don't have, find that big dog and run with them because guess what? They've already been made aware in an area and that can help you out. And then there's other things that you'll just have that awareness come when you spend time with God. Yeah. When you attack the fear and separate away and start to believe, you know what? He does love me yeah. and he's gonna reveal something to me. And you know what? When he reveals it, I'm gonna say it. I'll speak unto that mountain, be thou removed, right? Because I saw it, right? I heard it, I saw it, and he's going to have us do that. But there's something that happens to us through sin, whether we participate in it or somebody sins against us, that's called learned helplessness. Have you ever heard the term learned helplessness? Um, it's similar to being a victim. We picture a victim, you know, somebody that just either got victimized or they're just sitting there shaking and they're afraid. Well, that's, that's kind of a picture of a victim. Um, but learned helplessness comes out of, of being a victim. Right. Like you've learned from the time you were little that I'm helpless. There's no way out. I can't do this by myself. I can't try it. I can't create it. I can't be there. I, I don't know. <laughs> It's a, it's a pattern that over time, you literally learn to be helpless. Right. Um, you know, some of it's knowledge-based. Like, for instance, um, there's a real crisis right now with the young people that are coming up. They don't know how to cook. Right. They go out to eat a lot and everything, but when they get put in that spot, that's going to be a learned helpless thing. Right. They're going to feel like a victim. They're going to get mad at food, themselves, others, because I don't know how to do this. And, um, and so that can be a learned thing, but learned helplessness emotionally is really a belief system that's built in that nobody's coming for me. It comes out of neglect. It comes out of um, you know, traumas that never got resolved. It comes out of abandonment, being left. Um, so the belief system that is there that really says, well, I can't try that. I couldn't do something new. I'm helpless to the system. I'm helpless. And what it shuts down is in here and along with in your mind, but it shuts down in here, that motivating part where the spirit really moves on you. It, it, there's a, a shutdown valve there. And guess what happens then? It reflects because you know when you're helpless, it doesn't, nothing comes out your mouth of power. Right. Nothing says, I will. Yeah. I'm gonna. <laughs> this is. Because those are more um, direct statements. Those are things that 
declare and they're final. I'm healed. But when there's learned helplessness, it's like, I hope that I'm healed and, and you know, maybe we'll see, I'm trying, I don't know. It's, there's a feeling of helplessness that says it's, it's right in the edge of the impossible. And some people are feeling so helpless that they don't have any belief at all that God can heal, that God can take care of their finances, that God can fix their marriage or whatever it is. It, it's a learned helplessness. It's not coming out of the base of something horrible presently happening you know, if a man's beating his wife, she probably should back up from that relationship. That's something that's presently happening. But if she was trained in helplessness, she'll go nowhere and take the beating every time. Yeah. It's a belief system. So change requires also challenge. So I don't necessarily, I'm not really thrilled about crisis being the challenge. You know, um, you know like, yeah, let's, let's really bring about change. So something negative challenged me. But when you go for a positive thing, the negative will challenge you. So let's say you say, I'm done with poverty. I mean, it bites. It has nothing to do with God's kingdom. It's wrong. It's of, of the world. It's a secular way of thinking. It's demonic-like. And I'm done with it. I have a trained helplessness in this area. So you're admitting it. You're repenting. This, I, I mean, it literally, I feel lost when it comes to finances. God, I need to be a better steward. Change me in this area, right? So you already shifted that you made a choice that you're going to head somewhere. Um, and when you go to get the information it's going to take to make those changes, they feel foreign to you. It's like a foreign language. You're learning a foreign language. And nobody learns a foreign language overnight, right, Tom? Just a, it would be sweet, but it doesn't pop over. You're like, could you just pop over so I know this? It doesn't just pop over. And when, when, when you can't steward finances and you feel helpless in that area, then there's a fear base to it. It also causes you to not retain uh, information as well as you would if you weren't afraid. That's what trained helplessness does. And so then when we pop over, it's almost like we're learning this new language and we're trying to navigate it. Well, the world is just presently wicked. It's not like the devil at that point says, all right, rally troops. They're, they're about to go after prosperity. We gotta, we gotta come up with something. We gotta do, the world itself has been touched by sin. The devil really doesn't have to do much of anything. Wickedness is all around us, the Bible says. But take heart, he's overcame this world, yeah. right? So we're victors through it. Okay, we hear that, but now we gotta institute it. It has to manifest in our life. The truth is we are victors, but we feel helpless. So these two don't match. A lot of times that's the conflict that's going on with Christians is our confession doesn't match with our insides. Our confession doesn't match with our follow through. But we'll come up, we'll ramp up into it. I'm confessing it. And that's good because faith cometh by hearing and hearing the word of God. And if you're confessing that, it's going to have an effect. But if your inside really believes you're a victim or that you're helpless, it's not going to work as well. Amen? Amen? Yeah. It, doesn't, it doesn't roll the same. And so what happens when we have a learned helplessness is we can also have knee-jerk reactions from victim status. And so what we do is we create a barrier around us because we can feel the wickedness. We're pilgrims walking through this world, right? And we're supposed to be following the one with the rod and the staff, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. His rod and his staff shall comfort me. So we know he's going to take care of the business of the demonic and the wickedness, and he's going to lead us with the staff, right? That's, that's the path we're supposed to be on. And it's a good path, according to Jeremiah. He's got good plans for us. This is good. But what happens when we go to step out and we're in that, um, that helpless area, we're still walking through, and we might be, uh, walking right in, in being a Christian, a Christ follower, we're following him. But at the same time, anything that looks like it might come against us can cause a knee-jerk reaction. And our responses can be really ungodly at that point. Just ungodly. We can attack other people. We can, stuff will come out of our mouth that we're like, what was that? I don't even know where that came from. It's a knee-jerk reaction because we're trying so hard to do this new thing and it takes all your focus to do this new thing to come out of helplessness to be helpful, full of help, yeah. right? Anytime you put that word full on the end, just like faithful, you're full of faith when you're faithful, right? So we're gonna be full of help where we know that God's gonna help us, but we're not to that point yet 
what will happen is we're following him. We've got to keep our eyes on him. He's leading the way. And all of a sudden, if we take our eyes off at all, whoa, and a knee-jerk reaction will happen. And when that happens, that can trigger the cluster we've been talking about in the brain. And suddenly your eyes are not on him, and your eyes are on all the things that are out there. Whether they're there or not, your past will come up and, and speak to you. You know, you just know someone's going to take advantage of you because all of these different things have happened. And you had that one knee-jerk reaction, ah, and you pull up like that. Um, you know, it's almost like if I could do both knees, that's that fetal position. Infant, right? That's what we're doing in a knee-jerk reaction. And it depends on how far we pull our legs up. You might just do this a little bit. Well, you might be a teenager at that point. Your arrestment will just show your reaction is just a little bit. But if it comes up all the way and you're down, you're in that fetal position, you are helpless. And it's happened to all of us in some area of our life. You can have knee-jerk reactions in relationship really easy just by having been wounded and wounded and trained woundedness that you really believe that you're helpless. It's trained helplessness. So when we learn that, we have a low internal uh, locus of control when that happens. When we believe that we're helpless, the way the brain forms, just to break it down without going into six-cylinder words and all this, it's just break it down to your uh, ability to control thoughts goes away, and you're like, whoa, and you'll do a knee-jerk reaction. Your thoughts will pull in everything. It's like, I can't control this. That's the trained helplessness. It's a horrible feeling to have that. I've had that in my life. Over the craziest stuff too. You know, what's weird is I can go into, I told my husband this before, I was like, it's so dumb because I can go into maximum security, men, be alone in the classroom with 35 guys. And some of them are mean. And I don't care and I don't have an ounce of fear. I'm there with a mission. I know who I am. This is God born in me. I don't have to prove anything. I'm just there loving on people. But you touch another area that really is small compared to that knee-jerk reaction. Woof. It makes no sense. It doesn't even add up. So you can be mighty conqueror in an area. I mean, you can go be that bow hunter that just face to face with a bear and you're, and you're like, yeah, and gut them out and do the whole thing or whatever. But somebody touches finances and you're in a fetal position. Now, which one really is going to kill you first? Right? Probably be the bear. And so knee-jerk reaction pulls it in where, where you're literally, you know, it's like, this is huge. Why is it huge? Is it really that big? No, you're that helpless. You're trained in a helplessness that you can't see how big you are. Right? Suddenly, you're tiny and your finances are huge. And so we have to see that God's a big God, true. But we have to see that we're his children. Right. We ain't no little thing. Like I am a speaking spirit. I'm an ambassador of the Lord Jesus Christ. Right. I got rulership stuff going on. There's some kingly stuff. There's some queening up here on this earth, right? And when I walk, I'm walking with the full armor of God. And literally, when I step down into places that are absolute chaos, I'm coming with peace, nothing lacking, nothing broken, nothing left wanting. Peace every time I step, right? We can't see that, though, because we're in this physical housing. But if we have a heavenly mind and see ourselves, we look totally different than seeing what we see when we look in the mirror. It ain't always pretty in the mirror. This morning was rough. I was like, where is the putty knife? We need to do something with this. You know, it was kind of that kind of, I stayed up really late, you know, and all kinds of, a lot of speak engagements this week. And, and so I can't go by what I see. Who I am is who I am inside. And I need to be able to recognize I'm not helpless. Yeah, and my dad owns it all, by the way. And because of that, I can be a little bit cocky about it. My dad owns it all, world. You know, so when it comes to finances, for instance, I can call things differently out of that posture. But if I'm helpless, then even my prayers to my father really isn't a fatherly prayer. It's more like big guy in the sky prayer. It's more like, help me if you can. Won't you help me? 
you know, throw a few coins. I mean, it's that kind of thing. Would you grace me? I don't know. It's like rolling dice. It just doesn't have the feeling like, hey, dad, hey, dad, could you move something from the heavenly account over to my, right? So sometimes we'll be going after big projects and I'll, I'll goof around with my husband. I'm kind of serious, but yet I'm goofing around at the same time just to, to weld that into me. You're like, well, I'm just going to have to contact my heavenly account. Just like you'd say, well, let me get with my Swiss account. We'll get that million transferred over, right? You know, but really it is that thing. Let me get with the heavenly accounts. The little bank down the road here ain't my source. The heavenly account is my source. He just makes deposits in the little bank down the road. Yeah. See, yeah. that's who we really are. But if you're helpless, it's like there's this big God and you have to be so amazing before he'll even notice you. We don't know. You know, and I've always been poor. My mother was poor. And it's just some people are just born with a silver spoon in their mouth. Yeah. We come up with sayings right. to justify other people's prosperity because we're suffering with poverty. And poverty in finances is poverty of soul. It's not like your finances are over here and your soul is just rich. Like your thoughts are just rich and creative and, and smart and just got all this information, but somehow you're poor. If your finances are being affected, there's somewhere that you're poor in your soul. Right? So you have to look at it, mind, will, and emotions. We are spirit. We're rich in him. We're new creations in him. Spirit-wise, if I took myself apart and just put my body here, and then you'd see me in spirit, right? And, um, and then I've got to work with the soul, the mind, will, and emotions. It's like, ah, that needs tweaking. That's not lining up with where the spirit is. I'm a new creation in Christ. Christ is the anointed one in his anointing that breaks every yoke of bondage. That's the name Christ. Right, so if he breaks every yoke of bondage, then why isn't my soul, my mind, will, and emotions reflecting that? My spirit knows that. Who I am knows that. My body's going to find it out if I can just get this to go through the soul to get to the body. Like, we need to have a communication here. So really, these kinds of things in helplessness is a lack of communication in your being. From your spirit to God, move over through your soul to your body. We need to get that to work. And so when there's a lack of communication, that's really how simple it is. It's breaking down like, you know, something's not communicating here. I'm a heavenly being. I'm on this earth just passing through. That's why I'm here. I'm on a mission and I'm following him. And he's got the rod and the staff. I'm a Christ gen. I'm a Christ follower, the anointed one in his anointing. Where the power of God goes, I am in the midst of that. Right? So here we are. If you're, you're thinking you're helpless, then there's a whole problem to it. Um, your mind is an embodied process, really, that regulates the flow of energy and information. We can break it down that simple. It's an embodied process that regulates the flow of energy and information to your body. But it's got to come from what gives you life, and that's your spirit. When, when uh, the father went into Adam, he ruached into him. He brought him to life. He gave him the breath of life. Just body was laying there. And so your mind is an embodied process that regulates the flow of energy and information. And your brain is the neurocircuitry through which energy and information flows, concentrating in our head, but extends through the body. So that's that part of us, that gray matter, that we're using to send the information and the energy as it's concentrated throughout the body. Keep this thing alive. Keep this thing flowing. Keep this thing communicating. Every cell has communication built into it. We're so intricate. When you study any of that, it just blows your mind. You're like, I don't even know how I'm breathing right now because there's just so many parts going on right now as I'm talking. There's a whole communication going on in my body from one cell to the other, from one organ to the other, from the brain while I'm speaking. I mean, we are intricate. The gut actually uh, contains all the neurochemistry that resides in the brain. Isn't that interesting? You have a brain in your stomach. And it contains all the neurochemistry that resides in your brain. And your brain is what, again, the neurocircuitry through which energy and information flows. So um, when we come to a place of, you know, we're raising a child or we're, we're looking at how did I get to this helpless thing? 
we can look at look at it from a um, just an angle of some things lacking and some things and some things you have the blessing on. Perturbation is not challenging enough. That's when you don't challenge the brain enough. You don't challenge your your system enough. That there isn't. Remember, I said change requires challenge. So you go to the videos of uh, where was it? I think it was in Russia somewhere. Um, there are other places that had the same thing where they had orphans um, all crammed in, in these orphanages with maybe two people taking care of them and they never left the crib and some of them were strapped to the crib and they would just give them bottles and change them. What happened is that you, that's strange helplessness at its best because the brain never got to explore anything that says, I can conquer that. What is the stick? Huh, I've experienced that, you know? And that's why kids put things in their mouth all the time because they're trying to grow that sensory area that, that says sight, hearing, touch, you know, taste. And, and oh, it isn't just because they just don't know. They're literally wanting to taste of it. And so perturbation is not challenging your brain enough where you didn't get the opportunity to do certain things. Then what that does is that also gives us uh, you know, that, that feeling of helplessness because I never got to experience this, so how would I know? A lot of us have that. Our parents weren't superheroes. They didn't know everything and have everything and could give you everything. Um, so just lack of challenge can, can cause us to just not get it, and we feel very helpless in that area. Disorder is too much challenge. So when a house is in disorder, when yelling is going on all the time, that's disorder. Things are done in a non-orderly fashion. I'm not talking about perfectionism because that can actually challenge the brain too much. That's when you're overthinking something. There's a middle area that just says, we got to get this place in peace. Your brain will grow like crazy in that. And you'll just feel like, hey, I got to take on new challenge. Challenge me with something. That's why little kids, when they're on the playground, watch me, look, grandma, 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 grandma. You know, I mean, they don't just say it once. You know, for you know, those of you who have been at the park with your kids or whatever, it's like, I know my name. You know, but after 50 times, you know, they want to show you everything new that they've tried. Because that's that part that says, I need to be challenged. And I'm conquering every step up. Climbing up the slide backwards is a huge deal. Remember when that was a huge deal? It's like, you know, people come down this way. Yeah, but I defied those odds. You know what I mean? I go up the other way. Even when kids are coming down and it's dangerous, you know, I just climb up that puppy. Well, you're, you're challenging the brain. Disorder is too much challenge. And some of us have gone through constant chaos that put too much challenge on the brain, which trains you to be helpless. The brain will just go, I, 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 and it doesn't know what to do. And so it'll implode on itself. Shut her down, shut her down, and you don't get to experience something new. So that means when you get in groups of people, helpless. When things are coming at you, facts are coming at you fast, helpless. See, some of you are experiencing some of these things, and you just think you're whacked or crazy or, or dumb or something. These are real things that when we just look at the gray matter and say, how did that get developed? And just bring it down to something simple. There's nothing wrong with you. If you lived in an overstimulating climate, your brain's going to act like it was overstimulated. And if you overstimulate a child too much, it can actually cause learning disorders. A lot of what they say, ADD, ADHD, well, you know, they were just born like this. Actually not. In some homes, it was caused by the trauma and the stress coming at so fast, the yelling, the fast movement, the moving from place to place, the drugs, the I didn't get fed, all of that kind of stuff, that's way too much information. Yeah. Now we grow by challenge, but when you have too much, it shuts you down and you're helpless. And so then disturbance is the good middle ground when you disturb the brain. Like, let's just press that button. Let's just see what you know. That, that's that part that we can come by reading a book or learning new facts or something like that. You're disturbing it because the, the problem is, you know, we, as pastors, we disturb you every Sunday. Yeah. In fact, I take it to the point that it's dangerous because once you know, you can't not know and you're held accountable for what you know. I just disturbed you, <laughs> right? And guess what? For me to grow, I got to have my pastor, other pastors disturbing me. I don't want them to over... Uh, cause a disorder on me, and I don't want to be not challenged. 
So there has to be this middle ground where it's like, yeah, go wake it up. Come on, let's get moving. Disturb me. Um, weight loss can be like that. Workout sessions can be like that. You get in thinking like, yeah, I know, I'm going to lose this much weight in, in four weeks or, you know, it's going to totally change my life. I'll have a six pack by the end of the month. You know, I'm really going to set a program. That's what I'm going to do, whatever. And you get on the treadmill or whatever it is, it disturbs you. <laughs> because your idea now has to come and manifest in the body and your body's like, what? We're not doing this, <laughs> right? And so it sends a signal back that really says, I, why, why, why are you disturbing me? right? And so there's a point where we can be easily disturbed, you know, where we never do anything and you just ask somebody to pick up a book and they're like, well, that's a lot of stuff for me to do. You are very easily disturbed. But there's a place where we can grow to where we still, even I don't care, the best athlete still needs to be disturbed. Like we're going to touch that button. You need to challenge yourself. And sometimes we sign up for people to disturb us. Right? Like, we'll go to Lindsay and we'll say, could you disturb me? Really is what we're saying. Because I have plateaued and I'm comfortable there and I'm not growing. And so when I try to disturb myself, I don't listen to myself. So could you disturb me? That's really what we're doing. So we grow. We need to understand this. We, we grow um, when there's a disturbance. It's the good middle ground. And there's, there's a rest time that follows that. Disturb it, challenge it, make decisions, grow, rest. That sounds pretty good, doesn't it? But when we're not challenged enough, it's scary. And when we're challenged too much, it's scary. And fear gets infiltrated in there, and now we have trained to helplessness. Happiness is related to a person's ability to anchor their attention in the present moment. We need to understand that part of happiness is really dealing with the moment, conquering the moment, doing the thing in the moment. It's the detail, the detail that it gets you to the big picture. So let's say you're working out, you're in Lindsay's class or whatever, and she's working with you and she's, she's disturbing you. Well, if, you're, if you start thinking, I don't know how many weeks I can do this, you've already went out too far. Yep. You just better conquer the exercise in that moment. Right? Just do the thing that you're being disturbed about in that moment. Or when you pan way too far out, the helpless feeling will come and you won't finish anything. So it's eating the elephant one bite at a time. It's taking the moment and conquering it. And when you do the moment, next thing you know, you got a half an hour. It's like, I got a half an hour. Been on the treadmill half an hour. Been doing the exercise for half an hour. And it's no big deal to you because you took on the challenge. And when somebody says, let's do a half an hour, you're like, yeah, I already did that. It, you just go there. But now if somebody says, let's run a marathon, well, that's disturbing. Because that's going to be a challenge. I'm actually going to have to learn. I can't just go run the marathon. I have to work into it. Um, but if we're really feeling helpless, we will sit back from lack of information, from never having the stimulus of being in a sport or something like that. We already believe we can't. We're helpless. We just, we're just helpless. There's no way to do it. So exercising really challenges the brain. It'll challenge the brain even if you do 20 minutes a day because it's disturbing your body. It's also growing neurons that are healthy and it's repairing the brain. When you, when you do an exercise, like they have exercises where you do opposites, your brain wiring has to fire together in such a way it heals itself. So walking, right, we do the opposite. This is why it's really important for a child to not just stand up and walk but learn to crawl first. One, it develops their lower back muscles so that they're not skipping that. A lot of people have problems in their later life because they didn't develop those muscles properly in the crawl stage. But here you are. Now you're in full body on your, when you're on your hands and your knees and you're doing this. And a lot of times kids will do this, right? When they're crawling, they're going really fast across the floor. Somehow their head has to go back and forth <laughs> like it's swinging in the breeze. But it's just, a, it's just something that's it's welding the neurons by doing that. So what do they do if you're in physical therapy? I'm just, I don't know who I'm saying this for. This is not planned. Um, but if you've had problems in your body or problems where you feel like your brain is foggy or problems where, you know, it just seems like you favor one side of your body, people who have had a stroke, things like that, a uh, diabetic response where certain nerves are shutting down, do something that's in motion. That's the opposites. It's both sides of your body are working. 
it'll heal your brain. Side thought. All right, so I'm going to shoot through this, and you'll have to rewatch it um, just to kind of see. The amygdala in the brain is the color TV of your mem memory. There's a black and white, and then there's a color area. The amygdala, I like all these words because it always trips me up. Amygdala labels incoming stimuli from external world and body. So it's the thing that brings it in, and now we have to label it. We have to figure out where we put it. Where your hippocampus converts memory into a long-term memory. So Alzheimer's will affect one of those two, right? It can affect either. And uh, converts memory into long-term memory. So we've got those areas operating in the, in the brain. The limbic system is emotional control center of the brain. It encodes emotionally charged experiences. So it encodes it into your brain. So literally, um, the car accident you were in 10 years ago is sitting on your nerve endings according to your brain because it's in the brain memory. And so when you think about it, it can actually send sensations to those nerve endings and refire the pain you were in from the car accident. This is why chiropractors many times will have a, um, you know, a, a garbage can sitting next to um, the station that they're working with you on. Because when they move your spine into the correct position, you, it sends the nerves go la la la, right? And uh, these are all medical terms, la la la. And, um, and so when it does that, it refires on the end and the body will check, is this that accident? Is this what we're doing? And so afterwards, technically, you're just really hurting, but was it from getting your back put in? No, it was from recalling what was encoded on your brain. In fact, um, studies are proving you really don't have something called pain receptors. There's pain stations, but it isn't that it comes from those receptors. Your interpretation of pain comes from your brain and how helpless you feel. Isn't that wild? This is why Navy SEALs, one of their trainings is to retrain their brain so they don't feel it. Well, how can you change those? They got to feel it. It hurts when you slap somebody. It's actually, they can override that because they're telling their brain and the encoding something totally different. I watch this with our son when they're doing punching things and I'm just like, my body responds just watching it where I'm like, oh, just, you know, because you can kind of feel that and they'll just hit each other and that charge will go through the system and you're like, aren't you bruising? Isn't there some kind of pain that you're feeling? Not really. It doesn't mean they're disassociating. There is a part in the brain that we record with and it encodes on the system and then you interpret whether or not the shot is really gonna hurt. That's why some people can go, go ahead and give me a shot. All right, thank you, and you walk off. And other people are like, it's the shot, it's the shot, I don't want a shot. And are already, and then anything you feel is exaggerated and you really believe this is in the end of the world because you're getting a shot right now. So this is why we practice with our kids. I mean, it was just something, you know, like the, because they heard kids screaming when you go in to get shots or whatever. Other kids are coming out screaming. Well, that's horrifying for a kid. You're sitting there going, I'm going in that room next. Why? Why are we going in that room, Mom? And, you know, it's like, well, you got to do this thing. And I'm not real big on shots, but there were a few we had to do, right? And so um, when we did that, it, it, you know, right away, you see the kids tensing up and doing things like this and don't talk to me. And, you know, because they know they're so I remember, didn't know what I was doing, but I remember um, Eric saying to me, is this going to hurt? And I said, yes. I didn't go, yes, because I could train him how this is going to be way more painful than really what it is. I said, you want to know what it's going to feel like? Sure. So I gave him a little cheaper deal on, on his arm. He went, ow. I said, that's what it's going to feel like. Oh, well, I can do that. And he went in and he took a shot and went, but I set his brain to that. I'm not real big on tricking kids either because think about how you record that. Like, mom, you were part of that. You and that lady or whoever it was, like, you lied to me. And then they just shoved a needle into my arm. Well, then subconsciously, anybody's saying they're going to perform something or do something, you're like, mm, I don't know. I don't even know if I trust my own mother. You know, it's like, tell them the truth. We're going to get a shot. It's going to prick for a little bit. It's going to hurt a little bit. Or this one might sting a little bit more than the other. You can take it though, right? Yep. And you'll be surprised how kids will just sit there and go through it. So I'm saying this because I'm trying to show you we can be trained helpless. 
We can also go way over in the other ditch when there's pain going on or, you know, broken leg and we're told to suck it up and buck it up and, you know, wrap it up and go back to war. I mean, well, you know, we do need to acknowledge there is some things going on with your body. You might want to put that leg back on, you know? I mean, it's, it's hanging there. You might want to go get that taken care of. I'm talking about a balance, though, in that. And what we're really after this morning is that helpless feeling. Because you're far greater than how helpless you feel. And it's not pride. It's just who you are. Man, I can't even help who I am. You know? I can't. I can't help who I am as far as being a child of God. I got created as a child of God. That's who I am. And so why am I trying to get away from something that I am? So it'd be better for me to explore, who am I in this? How does this whole thing work? So um, the limbic system is emotional control center of the brain, encodes emotionally charged experiences. The brain wires itself based on the experience. So going back to the shot illustration. Highly stressful early environments set the autotomic nervous system at a high alert, sympathetically dominant. And so your sympathetic nervous system, if it's been trained that you're helpless, you're also going to be trained in high alert. And so when you think you're at peace, you're not at peace. You're just less stressed than you are when you're at a stressful level. But stress is still here. When peace is way down here and a different thing. But when you're trained, your sympathetic n- nervous system is trained like that, it's interpreting everything <gasps> like that. And you know what? If that happened to you, you, you couldn't help that. That's just what it is. But now you need to understand that about yourself because as soon as you feel that high interpretation, you're going to feel helpless. And then you'll hear us say, just have faith. Let's believe together. And then you'll learn that second face that you wear. That faith face, when really inside you're just, you know, you're freaking out, but you're like, yes, pastor, praise God. You know, N- no, you're freaking out. Let's, let's be real, right? I know when I'm freaking out, and I'll tell my husband, I'm freaking out. I mean, what's that going to hurt? I'd rather deal with what the real thing is. Like, let's put this back together because something's not working right. My head's on crooked. Let's get it put back into shape. And, and so we need to understand that our brain works this way and know that it's just that simple to acknowledge. You know what? That's how I was trained. I was trained high reactionary. I was trained in such a way where I filter everything like stuff's coming after me. Sounds are louder to people who have that. Lights are overstimulating to people who have that. Scrolling on a computer will make you want to throw up. And someone also said, well, it's all in your head. Uh, no, no. When your sympathetic nervous system is high like that, it's like heightened, you're going to feel like the earth is moving sometimes. Your sensory stuff goes off. You're not crazy and it's not demonic. It's just that's how your body is dealing with what your brain is saying. And your brain is a very physical thing that we have to take the spirit now and, and work through that. And that's the thing I get to work through now. So I've had some of that. And um, safe environments set the autonomic nervous system, um, I'm going to say this, to parasympathetically. There we go. I feel like a spelling bee. Parasympathetically, P-A-R. Um, anyway, parasympathetically do- uh, dominant mode. That's when you're like calm, you're relaxed, you're focused, and you're curious. When a child is raised in peace, they're curious. And you'll be all peaceful, and it looks like they're just ripping up the world. Well, they're touching everything, climbing on stuff. or what? Why? Because they're like, challenge. this is a challenge to the brain. I'm going to take this challenge. And they'll go through phases. That's why when you get to a child of three years old, you hear the phrase, I do myself. The reason they want to do it themselves is they've reached a point of development like, hey, I'm an adult now. <laughs> I can tie my shoe. And they'll sit there, you know, and they're trying to do it. And you go, well, let me help. No, I do myself. All right, you know, it's like you back out of it. But at two, help me, help me, mommy. Or they just get frustrated and you say, use your words. Well, I, I need help. And they'll do that because they're, they're seeing that there's information they don't have. They want to take the challenge on, but they don't have the information. And then three-year-old around that stage has watched it enough. They're like, oh, I still could take this. All right? Sometimes by the time you're six, you think you can conquer the world. And there's a healthiness in that. There's a healthiness in saying, let's climb this tree. 
you know? What has happened to our society? <gasps> don't touch that. <gasps> don't do this. <gasps> don't do this. Right? And so we're really saying, we're helpless. We're just helpless. We're so helpless. If you're going to climb a tree, do it wisely. Right. <laughs> so teach him wisdom. Is there, there's a big difference between all or nothing. Is like, I'm either going to let you just go crazy and climb it, and I'm not even going to pay attention. Well, that's not wise. Right. You know, they're four or five years old. It's like, that's a pretty big tree. That's a long fall. Right. That's a big hospital bill. Maybe not. You know, and so the or will come over to the other side and it's like, you're not climbing any trees ever. OK, so you never get that challenge. You never get to do that. And your brain actually will believe it'll set up a system that you're that helpless. And so the more things that we can experience and touch and conquer and not be afraid of, the more we will be conquering that area that feels we're helpless. And it won't mess with your faith. Because when we go to be in faith, the helpless part starts crying. And you're like, I'm trying to be in faith here. Be quiet. And it's like, no, you don't understand. I'm scared. And, and so now how am I supposed to be in faith? Now I've got to stop everything and argue with this thing. Well, I've come to the point, I'm not arguing with you. But I will make that unsafe place feel safe. Yeah. And then we'll make a choice together now. We're moving forward. But I'm not going to take a year trying to talk about this. Yeah. Right? So when something disturbs it, I'm going to take on the challenge, work through it, and we're, and we're going to move. So safe environments set that up in the nervous system. And um, you're, you're actually going to be calm, relaxed, focused, and really curious. So learning can be like that. When we've been trained to settle, where you get to a point where you settle, like, well, this is my training. I went to college for this. Oh, and then you can't learn anything else. No, because I'm a nurse. Okay. So you wouldn't want to try this over here but with, with construction? No, I was trained as a nurse. I mean, that's what we do. It's automatic. Like, we spend time and money, so that's it. I mean, if I, I've learned that if I could be 10 people, man, the things I could do. I used to be really helpless. Now I'm like, you know, it would be really cool to try all kinds of stuff. I mean, I would be in on maybe a brain surgery just to look, you know. Maybe just to look and learn some things. I mean, it causes you to be curious. What is that? How is that? Can I touch that? I want to taste that. I want to hear that. But what in your sensory reaction through your five ways of recording is shut down. Now you're only going to hear certain things, see certain things, and only certain things are allowed in. Now we come and we're trying to be porous to God. You're shut down. You feel helpless. And then our view of God is like, I don't know what you can do with all this, but psh, there's it. I can only record so much because I'm helpless. There's not a lot here I can do. I don't even know who I am to you. I mean, that's the feeling that it'll have. So um, it's something that, that we just got to be educated on and be able to know. Failure of perceptual engagement. Visual disengaged from social environment using past experiences to interpret present moment thus creating the past and the present. This is what I talked about last Sunday, that here I am in the present and I have memories. Know when that's triggered, now I'm in the memories and this is my present. No, it's not. I was beaten when I was five. I'm actually 55 right now. So I'm in the moment. But what will happen is it'll make you feel like what was going on in that. Now you're in the thought, that is your moment. No. No, that's not my moment. And in that moment, when you're inside the thought, is when you felt the most helpless. Now you're trying to do the now with the past being your present. That's not working out. Because now your past is, suddenly seems like it's your present, and you're going to decide things off of that. You need to disturb that. You need to press the disturbing button. <laughs> Like, hello, ring the doorbell. Hello, we're doing this different. It's going to challenge you. I am not inside of this. That did happen. I acknowledge it. I'm forgiven for it. I sent it away. I forgave who was involved. And I am going to stay in the now and decide in the present what I'm doing in this moment. I will exercise. In this moment, I will take my vitamins. In this moment, I will read the word. In this moment, I will go for a walk like I committed to God. I will do those things in this moment. But if you're in your past, and that seems to be your present, you will be paralyzed. Because those moments back then were paralyzing moments. That's when you used to be helpless. So the reality check I want to give you today is you are not helpless in this moment. 
You are now faith is the substance of things hoped for right now. Right now, in this moment. Yeah, but, well, yeah, I know that's a yeah, but, and it did happen, and I'll acknowledge it, and I'll give you a hug for it, and let's cry together, but we're actually right here. We're in this moment. You get to conquer this moment. Yeah, but I can't conquer this moment if I'm so helpless. Actually, that was your helpless moment. We're not in that moment. I'm giving you a reality check. Because when you feel helpless, things come out your mouth like, I don't know how we're gonna. I see, I've never seen anybody... And, and how is this going to come to pass? I mean, we don't have the, these are all the things, the resources, the know-how, the, oh, that's your helpless you. And that's actually from your helpless moments. This isn't a helpless moment right now. Amen. Amen. This is a powerful moment, okay? Um, so self-regulation comes out of that. When you can't self-regulate your thoughts or self-regulate your, your emotions many times, it's because of the helplessness. It gets triggered in that cluster, and suddenly you're helpless, and I can't regulate the now. I can't navigate my moment. I can't get out of bed. I can't, I can't figure out how to just get dressed and go out the door to do what? I don't even know, because you're not self-regulating. And that is not like you're a weirdo, you're a freak. That means there's something captivating you in your helpless side. You're not five anymore. You're not 10. You're not 12. I'm talking to your subconscious right now, giving it a reality check. You are the age you are right now. And even if something happened 10 minutes ago, you're not in that 10 minutes ago. You're in this moment. And you can create through Christ, through the anointing, a way out of this moment to go to the next moment in victory. What you do in this moment dictates the next moment set up. Right? So, but what happens is we'll focus backwards and we're not looking to set something up to go on to more victory. We're looking to, yep, it's going to repeat itself. I know it's going to repeat itself. See, look at that. Look at that. That's how helpless I am. It's, it's here now. It's here now again. I knew this was going to happen. Um, you're, you're not in that helpless moment. We're in the now. And I'm giving you permission to have victory in this moment. Okay? So... Um, the limbic system, you need to know about, it regulates emotional structures. It encodes implicit memories. And the, the core schema, it work, it's like a working module in you that um, brings about change in your, in your system or records memories to, uh, to kind of form the memory where you can tell your story. Some of you have been so traumatized. If I said, tell me your life story, you're like, I don't know where to start. Okay. Well, pick something. Pick some starting point. Well, when I was 12, and then you don't know what happens after that. And you can't figure out how that correlates in with what happened before that. It's really jumpy. Where you'll, you'll talk to someone else, like if I, if I say, you know, if I tapped into my husband's brain right now, and it would be a lot of it, we would be finely in sequence. And he studies finely in sequence because his brain got to develop like that. Mine did not. <laughs> that's why I'll throw a few notes on there, but I got to get away from the notes because it just, it's too much information. feels like it's yelling at me. I just got to share from my heart. That's how I, that's how I roll. And when we first we got married and we were in the ministry, he's like, honey, that's your note. What do you, that's your notes. <laughs> Three sentences is your note. I'm like, yeah, that's how I roll. <laughs> well, you can't preach a sermon out of that. I'm like, I do. People get saved, right? Yeah. Because that is how I am wired. It's too late. I'm wired like that now. Now I can put pressure on it and get, you know, some notes here. But sometimes if I have too many, it'll just throw me right off. Because I have learned that um, the way that I communicate, the way that my brain flows, I hear information intensely. I'm very visual. And when I speak, a lot of times I'll throw visual things out for that reason because that's how I'm wired. But now you get me too detailed and then I'm like, I don't even know what I'm talking about. Some of you may have that, but guess what? I was traumatized, traumatized, traumatized. Now, some of it could be personality, but you, you mix that with all the different things, the yelling and everything. That's just scatters. When there's too much going on, it scatters the brain. So if I got to rein it in too much, then I can't focus. So I got to go with how I developed and um, keep putting pressure on it. Disturb it, though. Disturb it to bring it down and 
write out a whole thing. Just disturb it. Put pressure on. Just don't go with it, but disturb it. And so we're going to take a look at a few scriptures since this is church, right? Probably should crank off a few. Um, anyway, Matthew 16, 19 is where, um, where we have been. And the reason, um, or where I told you to look up to begin with, the reason we're going here is to talk about keys. Now, it's really interesting to me that science comes up with new labels that the Bible's talked about for 2,000 years. And, uh, but a lot of times we won't put those two together. Just like gates, you know, uh, science says there's gates in the brain or levers in the brain or openings in the brain where, you know, information has to go through, but it won't go through unless pff, something opens the gates, right? The um, Bible talks about ancient gates. We've talked about that for a little bit. And um, when you can be going along just fine and not be having any of the stuff that your parents had that they were dealing with, but a lot of it's in your DNA, right? So you didn't have anxiety. You didn't have anything. You're going along. Now you're 12 years old. Something happens and disturbs the DNA. It will actually open up the ancient gates, the DNA of your parents, and go, well, now it's time to introduce this. Suddenly you're feeling your anxiety and everyone else's that passed down. And, and it's like, now I got the same thing going on that my parents had going on. Well, there's ways to heal those ancient gates through praise and worship, through the word, and we can't get into all that this morning. Um, but another word that, that we look at is the word keys. And I brought some keys this morning. I bought some fake ones, but they're old school. Um, had to rip them off my wall. But um, this says, And I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whosoever, whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth, I should say, shall, whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth, shall be bound in heaven. And whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Um, even including your gray matter. It's just dirt and water. Right? Your brain is dirt and water. It's earth. You have the earth, you have the earth, you have the dirt, that's the earth, you have the round planet that we're on, that's the earth, and then you have the earth that we're housed in, and we get to bind and loose in there. We get, we get to have those keys of the kingdom. But when you look up the word keys or key, it means something different in each spot. The word keys here is authority. So when Jesus died, um, and then he went down to hell. He took back the keys to the kingdom. Think the word kingdom, remember, is the sphere of his rule, his domain, how he does things. Somebody else took that spot, and he's like, give me back the keys. And then he turned, and he said, I give to you the keys of the kingdom. Well, that's great. We got the keys. We talked about this a little bit at, at TBO. That's wonderful. You got the keys. But you take a set of keys like this, and you hand them. These are ancient keys. And you, you hand them to a child, and you go ask them to unlock a door. They have the keys positionally, but they will sit there and try to get that in the lock and kind of trying to figure out which key goes in the lock. It's the same with us when we're unaware we positionally have the keys to the kingdom, but we're unaware of how to use them. Like we're packing. There's a, we, got, we got riches that we're packing. Well, then why am I so poor? We got health that we're packing. Well, then why do I get sick? We got keys to the kingdom. Well, where's the door and where's the lock and which coat? Yeah, I don't even know, right? Why isn't this working for me, the binding and loosing? Supposedly, I have the keys. And this is what creates doubt and helplessness in the body of Christ because we don't ask these kinds of questions. If I have the keys, then why isn't this working? You don't say that. Pastor Mary's preaching. You just, shh. You don't ask a question like that. You should. We should all be digging into that. Why isn't this working? I'm a child of God. I'm in position. I have authority. I'm an ambassador of the Lord Jesus Christ. If you saw me in the spirit, I am well decorated with gifts. And so are you. And so when I show up, I'm not coward and helpless. I show up and I'm looking outward and I'm looking, what do you have me to do, Lord? I'm here. I have the keys. What, what do you want me to do? Do I need to go through a door on this person's behalf? Well, I know that key. That, that's, that's this one. But if I haven't practiced using the keys and I don't know what key goes to what and I'm still infant in that because I believe that I'm helpless, I can have the keys, but they do me no good, 
right? Can you see that? You're presently sitting there with the key to open the door to the lock, that lock that's on the door to the thing that you've been waiting for. You have the key. No, I'm just waiting on Jesus. Oh, well, he's waiting on you. He already gave you all the equipment. Go do your work. Well, I'm still waiting on God. I'm just really trying to, trying to get a leading. I'm just waiting for doors and windows to open. And we make up all these phrases of things that, you know, we're waiting on when really he's waiting on us. That's why I've been accused of being a bulldog and all kinds of stuff. Well, guess what? I used to lay around and be helpless. I'm not helpless. I'm not going to wait in someone else's fear to decide to do something. If I have to go by myself and do it, I will do it. Though none go with me still, I will follow. I have the keys. Now, here's the other thing that can happen. You can be really good at the healing key. Look at that. I'm a, and you start carrying that one, right? Just like a kid. I know this key. This is the key for healing, right? But you don't know these other keys. I don't know what doors they go to. I don't even know how. To, or you know the door, but you can never get the key in right. But you know the healing key. So then what we'll do in a helpless state is that makes me feel helpless. This here makes me feel helpless, but I don't feel helpless in the healing area. So that's the only doors I'm going to open every day, all the time, in every ministry. I'm just going to open that door. And it's great to develop that. But then what will happen is the devil will make sure that the wickedness of this world speaks to you in the other areas the keys are needed. And your healing key doesn't work on that door. You see it? So this is where none of us have arrived. None of us have arrived. I mean, it was a couple years ago, uh, Calvin Woods was at TBO, and he, uh, it might have been three years ago now, he said to me, you have the keys to the city. I was like, thank you very much. Bring it. And then after he left, and I was praying and everything, then I'm like, oh, what doors am I supposed to try to unlock? What key am I supposed to use? I have them. The Lord was confirming to me, I gave you the keys to the city. And I'm like, okay, I got the keys. And just the, the, the helpless side of me, the little kid side of me, it was like, I got keys. See, I got keys. All right. Well, that's great. And you could go around and even brag about the prophecy. He said, I got the keys to the city. You know, and just be that, that little kid just bragging up a storm. You still haven't opened any doors. And that's what we do with prophecy many times. You know what he spoke over me? He spoke this and this. Well, really what we're saying is, I have the keys. Have you opened any doors with them? No. But I will tell everybody that I see that Doug Statton told me this. Eventually, that key has to open something. See it? And so it's great to have a healing key. Woo! But to have balance in our life, we need to know all the keys on our ring. And when you know those kingdom keys... Guess what he'll do? He'll get more detailed with you. He'll say, you got the main key, uh, keys to the kingdom? You got those? All right. You got that down? You know which door they go through? Now let's get even more detailed. I want you to use these. And you're like, Pfft. this is like me not opening the sound booth at TBO for a month, and we're in a hurry, and I'm supposed to find the key. And I'm like, okay. And I just go through. And I'm like, I thought I memorized it last time. Then I thought I marked it, but I guess I forgot to. I mean, it's a big deal, and finally I'll get the door open. You know, it's like a big production for me. When he will add to you more keys, but you don't get to have these keys until you have these keys operating. Yeah. Immaturity just goes, see all my keys? Well, you actually don't get to have these keys until these keys are operating. These are very detailed and gifting. These are the main keys to the kingdom. So it says, and I will give you the keys of the kingdom. The keys there mean authority. Where do you get authority from? The author. Who authorizes you to use the key to begin with? He's not the one who opens the door for you. He gave you the keys. He authorized you as the author to have authority to open the door. See it? So why do our prayers sound like, please, Jesus, open the door. Please open the door. Won't you help me, Jesus? Right? And we'll pray that we'll cry. Does he just not open the door? And I, I don't know what I'm supposed to pray. Now. What, do you have the keys? What are the keys to the kingdom? That's a whole series we should do. Those are the keys. What are they? 
And, um, and then, you know, talk about, we'll have to note that, talk about walking through the doors and different things. That's the authority. Now, Revelation 1.18 says, I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore, amen, and have the keys of hell and death. So that's actual key. There's some keys it talks about when you go and you study keys that angels have. They have keys to certain gates that they've been given. We actually have more keys than they do, though, because we're his kids. And you know what? Our kids have keys to our house. It won't be too many years. Eric will be 40 years old, but he has keys to our house. He can come in whenever he wants to. He's our kid. He's our child. More truthfully, he's our adult. And at the same time, how did he get those keys? We ran them off and gave them to him. He had to figure out how to get in the door. Now he can come into our house whenever he wants because he is our son. And he should have the right to. Same thing with our other son and our daughters. They have the keys. They should never come to the house and feel like they locked me out. I don't even have a key to get in. It's freezing. I don't know how to get in this house. I mean, I don't even know what to do. I don't even know if my parents love me anymore. Maybe I don't belong here in this family anymore. Maybe that's a message to me that says, go away. See, that's what happens to us when we go after things. Our view of helplessness really is, I didn't get any keys, and I don't even know if I'm really saved. That's why we get saved 50 times. Every time we have a poor behavior, better get saved again. Because we're really not sure that's the family we're in. Because we aren't aware of what keys he's given us. And so you don't have the keys, you don't have the results. You don't have the keys and you don't know how to use the keys, you don't have the results. Then what'll happen is who gets the blame then? God does. God, apparently you said you gave me keys and... I don't even know how to use them. You never showed me anything. And, and even when I try, it doesn't work. There, these are something wrong with me or there's something wrong with you. I don't even know if you are real. We have a whole generation of sons of God. That's who they really are that have amnesia to that fact. And they're walking around saying, I don't know that there's a God. I don't know. They, they haven't seen enough of the keys work. And it's not God's fault. It's we have amnesia to who we are. So there's a great awakening that happens in revival. A great awakening that is an outpouring of the spirit that wakes you up not to some new concept, some new way of healing, some new thing. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He wakes you up to who you already are. And what you already have. That's the great awakening. That's what's going to sweep this country. And all of a sudden, we're going to go, aha, we have keys. You want me to pray for you? I got a key to that. Yeah. You need to learn about prosperity? Got that key. It's a good one. Man, when you open that door, whoo, it's pretty in there. We've got keys already. And then what we'll see is we'll watch people. And this is a mature. I'm maturing the saints right now. This is my job. We'll watch people who operate They've already used these keys, and they know some finite, well, I mean, like they have some detail. There's all different kinds of keys on this ring. It opens small things and big things and lock boxes and things like that, and there's some of those things we've got to know how to do. But we'll watch them, and they're gifting, and then we'll just try to copy that. But we don't know how to operate in the main keys. It's backwards. God grows us into the finite details yep. the same way we wouldn't give our kids you know you know here's my insurance card and take care of this payment and all this and they're four right you better teach them on the main big keys to begin with before you get them on the little ones you better teach them on the main concepts and let's get some of those doors opening and then operate in that somebody asked me you know and they said wouldn't it be really cool to operate like doug does you know, or I've had people say Jim Isaacson. It doesn't matter. I've had people say that about me. Well, how many years have we been working these keys? Hard working these keys. Because you can play around and work keys only on the weekend. Or in, you can play around and work keys only when there's big trouble. 
Like, where's that key? We got to get in this door and we're fumbling and everything like that. Or you can choose to work them every day as often as intensely everywhere you go. Well, you do that, you're gonna get good at the keys. I don't even have to look, you know, I know my office key on here because I've used it over and over. Try to find the sound booth key, not so much. But the one out of all these keys is like, yep, there's my office, boom, I can go right in. Because I've used it over and over. But I have to actually be able to look at those bigger keys and then get these keys to be the backup for all that's going on here. That's called spiritual or maturity. We're maturing into operating in the things of, of the kingdom. Make sense? So let me read just a couple more scriptures. And um, can we go to Isaiah 22, 22? Let's do that one. All right, then I will set on his shoulder the key of the house of David. When he opens, no one will shut, and when he shuts, no one will open. There's a power authority in that key that's generational. It's of the house of David. Jesus is of the lineage of David, right? We have the Davidic reign inside of us. Then I will set on his shoulder the key of the house of that Davidic reign. That's a powerful key. That's a powerful key. What is the key to the kingdom that you've been fumbling around with and you're really honestly searching and you're like, I think I found the right door. I just, it just won't fit. It just, I, I turn it and I get this way and it's just not. What is that key? Because if it triggers when you can't get it in the lock, if it triggers in you that you're just helpless and you know nothing, and it's always been this way and this door probably won't open for you and probably your father gave you the wrong key. I mean, it'll trigger all that. That's helplessness, right? If that's what triggers within you, um, then you're gonna miss learning how to open that. You've gotta go with the trigger and say, really, I'm actually not helpless. I'm gonna learn how to use the key. I'm going to go to a big dog and ask him, how'd you get this door to open? Which key is it? And then when I figure out the key, I'm going to label it so I know exactly which one it is. And then I'm going to try that door every time. And sometimes locks are old. Ancient locks are old. And you need some, you know, what is it called? W40 or whatever. You need, you need the oil of the spirit to get in there like that. It's nothing wrong with the key. There might be something wrong with the lock. So let's pray that there's a moving of the oil of the spirit. Let's grease this puppy up. Now let's stick it in there and turn that key. Let's stand. So if there's something going on with your mind or your brain or your memories or that helplessness, and it triggers in you, and it takes you down a path of you are nothing, you have nothing, it'll never be, it's too late. All of that is trained helplessness. Now you know what it is. You're not crazy. You're not crazy. You're not less than. Now you know what it is. It should empower you to turn and go, well, hold on a second. <laughs> I'm not helpless. Yeah. Yeah. And when we are positioned all the time, this is for somebody, where we're constantly in a helpless mode, but we're trying to minister, it's hard to be helpful when we feel helpless. It's not that you're not gifted. It's not that you don't have the keys. It's not any of those things. It's a belief about yourself that says, I can't. It's too much. I, ah, that would be embarrassing. I'm not sure. It's helplessness. When he gave you the key, you are of the house of David. Amen. One of the greatest warriors ever. You are of the house of David. That Davidic reign that caused things to come on down. A man after God's own heart. You are of that. That came about that Jesus then followed in that lineage. It was set up. Purified all the way down. And now he dwells in you. And you have the keys to the kingdom. 
Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise you, Lord Jesus. Let's just wait on him a little bit. Praise you. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. We have keys that are authority. We have keys that are just exact keys to the right door. They're, that's what they belong to, just like one of the scriptures we read. That's the key to death and, and, and hell. That's the key. That's the one that opens that door. It's specific, and then it's authorized. Now, this is a word of knowledge, and you'll know if it's you. Where did I put my keys? It's a word of knowledge. I lost my keys. I, I just had them. I don't know where I put them. Well, where'd you put them last? I, I don't remember. Oh, maybe it was the time. Remember, so-and-so was in the hospital. That was like three months ago. Where'd you put them last? It's a word of knowledge to let you know when you find that within yourself, you put it on a key ring and it never leaves your body. It never leaves your thinking. You don't set it down. Where's your keys? Some of you, the revelation is going to come in the weeks to follow. You're like, I didn't actually know I had keys. I don't even know where to start. I don't even know where to begin with that. We might have to teach on that. It's not just knowing, it's knowing, right? There's a fact that I'm supposed to have keys. No, I know that I have keys. There's a difference. It's when the whole being lines up. Um, and, and some of you have been trying to go after those intricate keys, and you haven't worked these ones. You're not even sure how the kingdom works. And the intricate keys are frustrating you. You'll either go into shame or pride when you do that. Just a warning. Been there. You'll, you'll either be in that shame thing like, oh, I tried it and it worked this time and now it does and there's something wrong with me, I don't know. Or it's like, I can do this. Because you're trying to do these detailed things, but you haven't learned how to work the main keys. These keys are built out of the principles that are in these keys. You don't have those principles, these keys don't work outside of the, or the flesh. They'll work fleshly things. Father, we thank you. Raise your hand if you've been trying to use the key of prosperity. Okay? Some of you have opened that door. Some of you, it's like you're trying to kick the door down now because you can't get the stupid lock to, you know? Some of uh, it's so rusty. It's just the whole lock is just rusted. And, uh, you know, you kind of have the fear that if you stick it in there and try to wrench too hard, you'll break the key off. Father, we pray right now for a revelation on tithing because the Lord rebukes the devourer. And we pray right now a, a revelation of sonship when it comes to prosperity. Uh, and it's not this crazy way of thinking. Our father's not like that. And we're part of his family, so we think like he does. It's the way of just knowing he owns a cattle on a thousand hills, Right? And he will make us sit down in the presence of our enemy. and We get to dine in the presence of our enemy. He's so rich. Whether we were the prodigal son or we're the son who stayed home. Either way, we're sons and we get to eat at our father's table. So we break any form of poverty thinking. You are not helpless. And just like that scripture says, see, I'm working right now in the keys. I'm working right now in the keys. Just as the scripture says, I give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven, I get to bind and I get to lose. So I bind anything that has come against you in your thought patterns, in your earthly vessel, outside your earthly vessel, on this earth and planet, I bind those works that say you're helpless. And I loose to you right now through the keys of the kingdom the fact that you're not helpless, you're helpful. You're helpful to the kingdom. You're faithful. You're prosperous in all things, in all ways, at all times that you might give. Yes. This is who you are. Amen. Amen. This is who you are. Yes. I prophesy to you now, this is who you are. This is who you are. Yes. Amen. You're not his sick child. You're not his child, that, his lame child. You're not the runt of the litter. His children are equal. 
They're strong and empowered and they have the keys. You're not the sickly one, the left out one, the lame one, the left behind one. You are his son, his daughter. I prophesy to you, rise up into your sonship. Get a hold of those keys and start opening some doors. He'll empower you in the mighty name of Jesus. And those of you here who are helpless in your mind, that literally there's an area if that button gets pushed, you go fetal position, you go knee-jerk reaction until you're paralyzed. Whatever that is, whatever it came from was not of today in this moment. It was a present time, but it's not this time. It's not this time. You get to be victorious in this time in this moment, in this hour, for such a time as this, you get to get up and be victorious. You are not chained to that past. You are loose to your future. In the name of Jesus, I just used that key. See, in a prayer of agreement is when you say, yes, yes, I loose that. I am loose to my future. I bind the thing that's trying to hold me. And I am loose to my future. You're having victory in that moment and you're using the key in that moment. If you sit around, this is also for somebody, word of knowledge. If, if this, this is your key set and you sit and you look at them, I wonder how we're going to do this. I don't even know how we're going to pay for that. And you're a starer, you're a captivator. It's just looking at the keys. Huh? Huh? We study these keys for many years. We're just going to study them. We're just going to look at them. We're just going to talk about them. We're just going to, when are you going to use them? Well, I still got, I got a, a few more things. I, I really got to know about these keys. I'm really trying to memorize the keys. I'm really trying to, you know, embrace the key. I got to get a good feel too. You know, I got to get that feel because, you know, if I can hold it right when I get to the lock, you know, I got to have that feel. Be loose, free from that. That's a distraction. Pick up the key, find the door, stick it in the hole and turn it. You're loose, free. It's fear that's causing you to overthink your keys. How do I know this? Uh, little children, who you just show them how to unlock something, they're new in Christ, they'll go pray that prayer and someone will get healed. They just went and used the key. Or they'll come alongside somebody who's using the key, but they have a thing called go. Go ye into all the world. They're in movement. We contemplate. Man, we contemplate, we roll it over, we're thinking... I don't know, should I go street witnessing with the team tonight? I said, I, I, I gotta really study these. Maybe we should repaint them. I mean, red would be really nice, like the blood of Jesus. And we'll start making programs around it. Just go. Do something, be loosed, free. We're gonna pick up here next week. I prophesy change on this church. In the name of Jesus, changed. We are loose to move the herd and go to that next place. We are moving, moving, moving in the spirit. And we do not have to fear new doors because he's given us the keys to open those new doors. We don't have to fear, well, I already know back there, back there. We're not back there. We're here now. And we're going somewhere new, brand new. And he's going to provide for us the right key at the right time and the authority. Authority has already been given you.